just good? All right, you guys ready? Welcome to seminar. Uh, today's speaker is actually, this is going to be with his final exit seminar for Masters, uh, Josh Biggers. He, uh, so there's a, a couple of things to note here. First of all, he's the first student I've had that is actually a referral from a past student, so it's a little bit exciting sending people out and then having uh, Nate Bester was actually the one that, that, that called me up and said, hey, I have a really good intern working for me this summer. He's thinking about getting his master's. So it's sort of nice, sort of having that, that network be built. So there's a little proof that, that you know, things can, can be played forward. Um, we also have a lot of people in the room that are, have a bet. They, a lot of people just came so they can hear Josh talk. So hey, this is Josh. <laughs> you might not know him. He's been in the department for about, what, seven or eight years? <laughs> you wouldn't know because he doesn't speak, which has been really good as far as the gratitude goes. Um, it's, it's, it's been a pleasure. No, he's a really hard worker, uh, and he is really quiet. But, so we're going to enjoy uh, listening to Josh talk about his master's. Yeah. Uh, hi, guys. I'm Josh, as I'm sure many of you know me, as the guy that will talk your ear off if I catch you in the hallway. But, um, <laughs> regardless, I appreciate you guys all coming out as we get busy with planting and field work. So today I'm going to talk about the research that I've done in my last two years here at Iowa State. The title of my seminar is The Impact of Fungicide Application Methods on Soybean. So the outline for my talk today, I'm going to have three main points. I'm going to begin by discussing different fungicide application method, methods that have been used in soybean. I'm going to start with the very first thing that farmers tried to use and then talk about a little bit of futuristic technology. From there, I'm going to pick two of these application techniques and compare them and how they differ in coverage, disease control, yield, and seed quality. And then lastly, I'm going to wrap it up with the general conclusion and look at some future research that might be necessary. So first, I'm going to start with fungicide use. Now, picture yourself as an Iowa soybean farmer in the early 2000s and you go into your local coffee shop with all the other farmers and you say, you know what, I'm going to apply fungicide to my soybeans. You would have got a lot of heads turned and some probably would have called you crazy. Because in the early 2000s, a fungicide application to soybeans was very uncommon. However, right around 2005, soybean rust became a big scare. And this got farmers interested in fungicides and what tool they would use to apply these fungicides if they needed to. And while soybean rust never became super problematic, it did do a few things. It opened up farmers' eyes to different soybean diseases that impact their soybeans, and it got them thinking, what application tool would they use to apply this fungicide? Additionally, if you look at a fungicide label, there's almost always this part that says, you need to achieve thorough coverage for high fungicide efficacy. And this leaves farmers wondering, how can they achieve this good coverage? And in general, you'll find that fungicide application methods have remained relatively unchanged. So here is a graph on screen of the percentage of soybean acres in 2017 that had a pesticide applied to them. Now you're probably thinking, wow, only 14% of soybean acres had a fungicide. That's not very much compared to soybeans that had 95% of the acres treated. But in fact, I think this is significant because if you would have looked at this graph in the early 2000s, fungicides would not have even been on here. So the fact that we've moved from zero to 14% in 20 years is pretty unique. As I mentioned, um, soybean rust really got farmers interested in fungicides. And although it never became super problematic, it opened their eyes to other important soybean diseases. Some of these include frog eye leaf spot, septoria brown spot, and white mold. So frog eye is a disease that you see in the upper canopy on those topmost soybean leaves. While septoria and white mold are diseases you see in the lower canopies. So already you can see only three soybean diseases, but they require a little bit different management. Additionally, there's other soybean diseases like cercrospo leaf bite and soybean rust. But for today's talk, I'm really just going to focus on frog eye and septoria. Now, 
Now before I get into the actual technology, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about nozzles and timing. The nozzles and timing are important, and you can find a lot of literature about them because they're simple, relatively inexpensive changes that farmers can make. This research answered questions like, which nozzle should I use? What droplet size and what volume? And in general, you'll find that small droplets are the best for achieving thorough coverage. <clears throat> Additionally, if you increase your spray volume, you can improve your coverage as well. And then this also answered the question of, when should I apply my fungicide? And for most diseases, including frog and septoria, you see that applying fungicide at the R3 growth stage provides the best return on investment. And the R3 growth stage is the beginning of pod development. So when you apply here, you are protecting those leaves and keeping them more green and healthy for photosynthesis. So you have a chance to protect your yield. Here's a little bit more about nozzle technology. On the left, these are just some of the different nozzles that farmers can use. And on the top is different amounts of pressure. So every sprayer is a little bit different. But if you look at all these letters here on the chart, you see a lot of different things. VF stands for very fine. So that would be the smallest droplet size you could get. Whereas the green box with the VC represents very coarse, and that's the largest size droplet. So in general, you want fine droplets. Those are the best. And if you use very fine, you run into certain problems. A very fine droplet has a difficult time penetrating the canopy and getting onto those lower leaves. Additionally, very fine droplets can be subject to drift and evaporation. And in general, you find that flat fan nozzles do a good job of getting you these fine nozzles. So just as an example, on my research, I use the XR11002 nozzles at around 30 pounds of pressure. So I used fine droplets right here. So now I want to transition into the actual application equipment. And I'm going to start with the very first one that farmers ever tried to use. And that is the traditional ground sprayer. So right here, you have a horizontal boom. And attached to this boom, you have nozzles that spray the droplets directly on the tops of plants. Benefits of this method include size. It's not uncommon for these booms to be 90 to 120 feet wide, allowing farmers to cover a lot of acres very quickly. Additionally, farmers use this same application tool to apply their herbicides and insecticides. And it works for those applications, so they feel comfortable in using it for a fungicide. With them already having this equipment and the ability to cover a lot of acres, they can save quite a bit of money with this technology. Again here, you have your boom right here with the nozzles attached to it, and they're spraying down onto the top of a crop canopy. And here you can begin to see the limitations. So if a droplet's being released here, it has a long way to go to reach those lower leaves to protect against diseases like septoria. And your main disadvantage is that, the ability to penetrate the canopy. The second method I want to talk about is the air-assisted sprayer. And these have been very popular in areas like Europe for quite some time. But they really didn't make their way over to the United States until the 70s or 80s. This method uses a fan, which I have the arrow pointing to out on the screen. This fan opens up the canopy and drives the droplets further down onto the plant. Benefits of this method include using less water. And additionally, when you look in the literature, you can see that, in fact, this method does provide better coverage in the middle and lower canopy. The disadvantage of this method is size. The maximum boom size you're going to have is 60 feet. So already, that's half of what your traditional sprayer would be. So here you have more cost because you're going to be in the field longer, more labor, more time. Additionally, these units can be a little bit more costly. The next method I want to talk about is electrostatic sprayers, which charges the particle to be either positive or negative, depending on the current. These droplets then become polarized and are attracted to grounded objects. So these droplets want to be on the soybean leaves. And this prevents losses to things like attachment to the soil, drift, and evaporation. 
Benefits of this method include it can be attached to all sprayers. These nozzles can be used on traditional sprayers, air assisted sprayers, and even hand booms. And you do see better retention when you use this method. The disadvantage though is that when you take this out to the field you see some inconsistencies. And in general, these are typically better for a controlled environment, say a spray chamber or within a greenhouse. Additionally, this can be costly. If you have a large, say 120 foot boom, and you put this on all your nozzles, it can add up quickly. The next one I'm going to talk about is the canopy opener. And this is a metal bar that attaches to your current sprayer, but this bar rides lower in the head of the sprayer. And in doing so, it allows you to bend the top of the soybean plants over, and while the tops are being bent over, the nozzles are spraying down, reaching the, the leaves that are being exposed. So watching those middle and lower leaves. The idea behind this is that it is designed, developed, and implemented by farmers, with stuff they either have around their farm or could easily attain. You won't see this sold as a commercial product. The disadvantage of this is that it's not always practical. You're adding a lot to your boom, and when you go to move from field to field, if you have that large 120 foot boom, you'll likely have to take this off. And that's gonna take time and labor. Additionally, as you bend the tops of the soybean plants over, there's potential to cause damage. This damage creates wounds that allow insects and other pathogens to enter the plant, which defeats the purpose of your spreading. The next method I'm going to talk about is the drop leg extension. And these are just attached to any current boom. It's like a fish hook design. And on the end, you have one or two nozzles. These nozzles spray upwards to get those lower leaves as well as the underside of leaves. Benefits, this is easy to use and it's easily attachable to the boom. And in fact, you do see improved coverage, especially on the underside of leaves when you use this method. Disadvantage of this method is that it's set on specific row spacings, which is better for things like vegetables, not soybeans where you can have anywhere from 15 inch rows to 30 inch rows and everywhere in between. The next one I'm gonna to get to is advanced sensors, which are attached to your sprayer. And this uses a computer and a camera to communicate with your sprayer. So for example, the camera is viewing the field ahead of the sprayer and it senses a more dense canopy. It relays this message to the sprayer and the sprayer then increases the volume of the spray in an attempt to get better coverage. Benefits of this method include cost savings down the road potentially and also using a fungicide more responsibly. But the disadvantage is the initial cost is very high and there's still a lot of testing to be done so I think most people would agree this application will probably be more economical for high value crops, say grapes and apples. And then the last one I'm gonna to get to is the undercover application. And this is the one that currently farmers in the Midwest are really excited about. And if you can think back to one of my earlier slides when I was talking about frog eyes, septoria, and white mold, and how you have to think about managing those diseases differently because one's in the top and one's in the bottom, well, this is a technology that would allow Iowa soybean farmers to accomplish that. Here you have a nozzle body that runs between the rows. And while that's running between the rows, you have two nozzles spraying to the side, while one sprays back upwards to get the underside and those lower leaves. While this is running through the canopy, you also have your boom on top spraying down, and those droplets are landing on the top of the crop canopy. So again, here's just a picture of that. These nozzle bodies running between the rows with the three nozzles, and then this boom is spraying down as well. So those droplets are landing on the top of the plant. The disadvantage of this method is cost. It's gonna cost about $15,000 to add this to your existing sprayer. And then as you can see with just the pictures, your spray width is not that large. So for me, for my experiments, mine was 35 feet. So that's a lot less when you think about a 90 or 120 foot boom. So the question of my research is to really look at that first method that farmers used, 
compare that to a new technology that they're really excited about. Again, here's the traditional application spraying down on the top of a crop. And then we have the undercover, which is running through the row with multiple nozzles, as well as spraying downward. So before I move on, does anybody have any questions about what the difference between these two are? Because that's going to be the bulk of the rest of my talk. Right, cool. So to test the difference between the traditional and the undercover, I was fortunate enough to be able to do small plots and on-farm trials. We're going to start with the small plots. So anytime you see this grid-like symbol on the screen, that just means I'm talking about small plots. And if you see three dashes or three lines, that's on-farm. I'm going to be bouncing between the two methods and the two field designs. So for my small plots, I had six locations, two in 2017 and then four in 2018. And these plots are 10 feet wide by 20 feet long. So that's four rows of soybeans with 30 inches between the rows. Rows one and four kind of act as your border and rows two and three are your rows of interest. These are the rows you spray, collect data on, and then ultimately harvest. So here you can see rows one, row two, row three, and then row four. And here would be a small plot sprayer. Again, rows two and three would be between the wheel tracks of that sprayer. And then in the fall, you come back and you harvest again, rows two and three, with the two row combine. And then for my second one, I had experiment uh, on-farm strip trials. So for this, I had two locations in 2018. And again, if you see this symbol in the right-hand corner, I'm talking about on-farm strip trials. So with these trials, we use all the farmer's machi machinery, so it's much larger scale. We use their planter, their sprayer, and then their combine, which was calibrated to less than 1% yield error. So as you can imagine, these are quite a bit larger. So these would be 35 feet wide, which is 14 rows of soybeans with 30 inches between the row. And then these would be three quarters of a mile long. So here's just um, my experimental design, a little bit more about that. So on the left, we have the on-farm strip trials. One represents the untreated control, three would be the undercover, and two would be the traditional spray. And then there would be two more replications to the left of this. So there's three reps in total at my on-farm locations. We only have three reps because of the size and cost of these experiments. On the right, this is what my small plots would look like. Again, I had six locations, and at each location I had eight replications. All right, so here's a video I'm gonna show. This is the undercover sprayer in action at one of my on-farm trials. Fungicide. It has a group 7 SDHI in it, as well as a group 11 QOI. The active ingredients are listed on screen. I won't try to pronounce them because I always say it wrong. But we selected this fungicide because when I had started, it was very popular and Iowa farmers were having a lot of success using it. 
So first up, I'm going to talk about coverage. And to do so, I broke the soybean plant into thirds. We'll start with the upper canopy, middle canopy, and then the lower canopy. This is going to be important because I'm going to talk about this for my next few slides. So I use two detection methods. The first is the spray card method. And this is just six water sensitive spray cards placed on a soybean plant. So I have two in the upper canopy, two in the middle canopy, and then two on the lower canopy. So these two cards would be on the same leaf. One would be on the top of the leaf, and one would be on the bottom of the leaf, and they were paper clips together. So when I talk about these values right here, these two cards will have always been added together. So these cards change from a yellow to a dark purple when they come into contact with the fungicide. And this allows you to see the distribution of the fungicide in the canopy. Following application, I would go in, I would remove these cards, I would take a picture of them, and then I would use a computer program to analyze the percentage of the card that was covered. And again, so these two cards would be combined as one value. So here's a water sensitive spray card before you place it in the field. And these are about two by three inches. You conduct your fungicide application. And this is what the card could look like following application. So real quick, does anybody have a guess on what percentage of this card is covered? Five percent. So he says five percent. Actually, it's seven percent. And so this is the reason why we use that computer program, because it's really hard to get an accurate number with your own eyes and then stay consistent. The second method I used is what's known as the tracer dye method. And this is a relatively new method for tracking fungicides. It's been used a lot in the weed science literature. So this is just a PTSA tracer dye that is mixed in the fungicide tank prior to application at a rate of half a pound for every 100 gallons of spray volume. And immediately following application, I would go in and remove a trifoliate from each one of these zones. Again, the upper canopy, the middle canopy, and then the lower canopy. These trifoliates were placed into a bag with isopropyl alcohol, which was agitated against the leaf for 15 seconds. The remaining liquid in the bag was drawn out, placed into a cuvette, and that was set to a fluorometer for a parts per million reading. And now I'm going to get into some of my coverage results. Okay, so we'll start with the small plots. Again, with the symbol. And for here, I had six locations. Now it's important to keep in mind, again, with the two cards that were in the upper canopy, they were combined, so for one value of 16. So when you look at the percentage of spray card covered, in the small plots, you see no significant difference between the traditional and the undercover location at any of the three zones in the canopy. You look at the upper canopy, and you see the traditional with a little bit higher percentage coverage, 16 compared to 15. You shift to the middle canopy, and here you start to see the undercover with a higher percentage of those spray cards covered. And then again, you see this in the lower canopy with the undercover having 13% of those cards covered as compared to six in the lower canopy. And here on the bottom, this is the tracer dye method. So keep in mind, these are in parts per million. And again, between both treatments, you see no significant difference at any zone in the canopy. Here at the traditional, you have 2.2 parts per million as compared to 1.1 in the upper canopy. You shift to the middle canopy, but here you see the traditional is still higher than the undercover. And then in the lower canopy, they have the same exact value, 0.7 parts per million. And now we'll just look at the same thing, but for my on-farm location. Remember, this is just two locations in 2018. And here again, we see no significant difference among treatments at any of the three canopy zones. But here, when you look at the upper canopy, you see the undercover actually has a higher percentage of that spray card covered. And when you look in the middle canopy, you see the values are very close. And again, you see that in the lower canopy, where the undercover just has 1% more coverage. 
in here. For the on-farm trials, when you look at the tracer die method, again, these are parts per million. And here again, there is no significant difference. If you look in the upper canopy, you can see the traditional has a little bit higher here with 1.9 parts per million as compared to 1.2. When you shift to the middle canopy here though, you see the undercover with a higher value, 1.6 parts per million as compared to 0.8. And then on the lower canopy again, you see the undercover with a little bit more, 0.7 parts per million as compared to 0.3. So another way I want to look at that, this is as a spray distribution. And so again, these are just theoretical values. Say that was the percentage of the card covered for the two cards. They're always added together. But then if you add these all together, you would get 62. And then you would take each of the values from each of the three zones and divide it by 62. And then you multiply by 100. So for the upper canopy, you would expect 27% of your fungicide to be in that location. Whereas for the middle canopy, you would expect 58% 58 of your fungicide to be there. And then when you look at the lower canopy, you see 15%. And these will always add up to be 100. So this is going to look at them again, but as a distribution. We'll start with the small plots. And again, if you added the traditional up across, it would come to 100. And here we see our first significant difference in the upper canopy when comparing the traditional and the undercover. The traditional has a lot higher of a value. You move to the middle canopy, and you see the numbers are almost the same. 46% compared to 51. And then in the lower canopy, you see here the undercover with a little bit higher, 20% as compared to 14. You can use the same distribution technique with the tracer die method. And here we see two significant differences in the upper canopy and the lower canopy. We'll start with the upper canopy. You see 50% of your spray volume with the traditional application where it's the undercover only supplies 35%. When you move to the middle canopy, you can see these values are almost the same, right at 33 and 34%. And then again, it's significant at the lower canopy where the undercover does a better job with 31% coverage as compared to 17. And again, you do the same thing for my on-farm trials. And here, there is no significant difference. With this one though, you see the undercover has a little bit higher of a value than the traditional in the upper canopy. Move to the middle canopy, and what do you know? The numbers are the exact same. And then in the lower canopy, the undercover doing a little bit better of a job, but not significantly different. Again, here we have the tracer die method with no significant differences between the treatments. You look in the upper canopy, and here you have the traditional putting on a lot more fungicide. Move to the middle canopy, and that's where the undercover starts to show better, or more fungicide displaced there. And then in the lower canopy again, the undercover doing a little bit better job. So just to summarize coverage, first, I think there's a difference when you're looking at research versus farm equipment, and not just the size. They're traveling at different speeds, they have different types of pumps, and as a result, the pressures could be different. I think it's safe the trends are a little bit inconsistent. And in general, when you look at spray cards, you see more distribution there in the middle canopy. Whereas if you're using the dye method, you see a higher value in the upper canopy, and this value decreases as you move down in the soybean plant. So I think there's some work to do to figure out you know, which of this these methods is best for detection because if you think about the spray card method, as you would imagine, it takes a lot more time and labor, whereas the dye method is relatively quick. So coverage is great, but what farmers really care about is the ability to control disease. And for most of my experiments, I had a lot of frog eye and septoria. Again, remember, frog eye is usually up in the upper canopy, where septoria is in the lower canopy, and it works its way upwards. 
So here's just an overview of frog eye and what it looks like. This is pretty common in the southern states, and as a result, it blows in with the winds and lands on those upper leaves. Additionally, those young leaves on the top of the soybean plant are more susceptible. Frog eye has small lesions that are circular to irregular in shape with tan to gray centers and darker edges. So here's some of my frog eye disease severity results and we'll start with the small plots. And for both the upper canopy and the middle canopy, there was no significant difference in the ability to control disease. As you can see, these numbers are very close. And the UTC is the untreated control. You look at frog eye for my on-farm strip trials, again, you see the same story. No difference among the treatments, regardless of the location in the canopy. And then we'll get to septoria. And this is the, usually the first foliar disease that appears, and it's almost in every field, every single year. And you have small, brown, irregular shaped lesions and the leaves usually turn yellow and can sometimes drop off. Yield loss is really impacted by weather and how far this disease moves up in the plant. If it gets really high up in the plant, especially during pod fill, you can see yield loss. So here's the septoria disease severity ratings. And again, whether we're talking small plot or on-farm strip trials, there is no statistical difference among any of the treatments. So now we'll get to what the farmers really care about, and that is the yield results. They need to be able to see a difference in yield for, the, to make, for it to be worthwhile for them to invest in one technology over another. And as you might expect, our inability to control disease didn't allow us to see any differences in yield. If we look at small plots, we averaged around 57 bushels an acre, and for the on-farm, we averaged around 53 bushels an acre. So you guys might be wondering, you know, what's going on here? We were able to detect that we were getting fungicide on the plants. Both methods showed that. We had fungicide in the lower canopy, middle canopy, and the upper canopy. And I think this can be tied back into some of the research that the Mueller lab did in 2018 with the statewide fungicide trials. So here we have seven locations where we test up to 20 different fungicides for their efficacy. Three in northern Iowa, one right here in Boone, and then three in the southern half of the state. And this is kind of what we found, that resistance is becoming an issue. So here on the bottom, you have different fungicides, and then on the y-axis, you have the severity. And this is averaged across all seven locations. We'll start on the left side with the untreated control. To the right of that, you have approach and quadris. Those are both group 11, fungicides. And if you remember back, I used Priaxo, which was a premix. It also had a group seven in it, but it also had an SDHI. And then there's all these blue bars here, and these are all premix fungicides. And there are varying differences with them, but when you look at it, which one is the highest bar? Yeah, Priaxo, the one I used, showing that we might have an issue with resistance here. Again, same story for septoria. You have the different fungicides on the bottom and then the severity ratings on the y-axis. Again, you have your untreated control to the far left. And then again, you have approach and quadrants, those group 11 fungicides. And here you can look at all the blue bars and these are pre-mixed fungicides. And there are differences among them. But when you look at the highest bar, again, it's the fungicide I used, Praxor showing that we might have a resistance issue here, and that Praxor, although it is a premix of two fungicides, it's relying heavily on that group 11 QOI to do the work. So this kind of goes to show that we picked a fungicide that really doesn't work. So my conclusion for disease control and yield, first, Praxor is no longer effective against two of the most common soybean diseases that Iowa farmers face. That issue allowed us to not see any difference in disease control, and as a result, no difference in yield. So 
So now I'm going to get into a little bit more about my talk. I didn't want to just look at foliar diseases. I also want to look at diseases that could impact the seed. And I looked at things like seed health, propamopsis, seed decay, and seed composition, protein, fiber, and oil. So for these, I took, I collected seeds at harvest from two small pot locations in both years. Let me start with pomopsis. This is a diaporthy disease complex, and here's what the seeds look like when they're infected. They have this crinkle-like appearance to them, and they're usually lightweight. This disease is present throughout Canada and the United States, and seeds become infected as plants mature. And this disease is really favorable, favorable in certain weather conditions. It likes temperatures that are warm, high humidity, and moisture. So to test my seeds, I used the water test. And you're probably wondering why this is important. This is important because farmers want to grow good quality seed, but also those farmers that grow seed that's going to be planted in future years need to have good quality. Seeds infected with pneumopsis can have lower germ germination and poor emergence. So to do the water test, I did it over in the Seed Science Center. So I collected several pounds of seed at harvest from plots, and of that several pounds, I collected 100 seeds at random. These seeds were cleaned with bleach, and the bleach was washed off with sterile water. Um, then I placed two sterile waters in the water box and used Botran fungicide. This is used to keep contamination down for things like rhizopos. I then placed my 100 seeds in the box, making sure they weren't touching each other. And I put the box in the incubator for seven days at 25C. And here's some of the results I got. Again, no differences among treatments. If you look in 2017, about five seeds out of 100 were infected with pomopsis. Whereas in 2018, nearly 20 seeds were infected with pomopsis. So you can see 5% compared to 20, that's a big difference. Here's just a visual of that. This is what they looked like on average for 2017 and 2018. So you might be wondering why such a big difference. I think a lot of it comes down to weather data. Again, if you guys remember, this disease likes temperatures that are warm, high humidity, and moisture. I think September 2018 tells that story. In that month, we had six more inches of rain than the 30-year average. It would rain, get warm, rain, get warm, and repeat that. As a result, this created a favorable, favorable environment for the disease and also pushed back harvest further into October. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about and look at is seed composition. So seeds infected with pathogens can have varying levels of protein, oil, and fiber. So to test this, I again collected seeds at harvest. I took 500 seeds and I placed them in the top of this machine. This machine takes subsamples of that sample and shoots light through them to detect the levels of protein roughly. And so here's some of the results I got and I combined this across years. And surprisingly, the values I got were almost always the same. For protein, right at 34%. For fiber, right at 5%, and then for oil, right at 19%. So what's the take-home message of this talk? First, I think it is that fungicide resistance is a real problem in Iowa. And if we don't take this into consideration, it's not going to matter which application a, a farmer picks. He might as well just stay at home. But if we are going to compare the traditional and the undercover, coverage, I think there's still some work to be done. When you look at using the spray card detection method, you pick up a vast amount of your spray right there in the middle canopy. Whereas if you use the dye method, you see a higher value in the upper canopy, and this value decreases as you move downward. So again, there's varying levels of work to them, so it'll be nice to figure out which is the best method to use. And more importantly, the resistance negated our ability to determine a dif difference in disease and yield. And that's what the farmers really care about and want to know. 
So I think there's future work to be done, potentially using a fungicide that is a little bit more effective. And with that, I would just like to say thank you to a lot of people. First, thank you to Darren for allowing me to come to Iowa State. I've had a blast here the last two years. Thank you to my committee members, Allison, Matthew Dar, and Mark Westgate. They helped me out tremendously with my research, especially some parts I didn't get to talk about today. And then thank you to Stith. He always made sure that my plots were planted, sprayed, and harvested on time. He was super helpful. Uh, thank you to Andrew. He, made, he allowed me to have these on-farm trials because there were so many people. And he was great about coordinating all that. Thank you to Yuba. He helped me with the stats. And then thank you to Brandon because he made the video that you guys saw earlier. And then lastly, thank you to my funding agencies. John Deere funded me my first year and then the Iowa Soybean Association in my second year. And with that, uh, thank you guys again for attending. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Josh? I won't. So like traditional, coverage, you have a gallon per acre that you shoot for as your total volume. Undercover, you've got a lot more nozzles. Like, how does gallons per acre come into the equation? You talked about volume being a player in control and coverage. Yeah. So the question was, how do the traditional and undercover differ in terms of volume? Um, yeah, so everything was calibrated so that we could get that for fluid ounces per acre, but there is definitely differences when you're looking at four nozzles as compared to one. So I'd have to look back at my notes to be I meant the carrier, not the fungicide. Like, if I spray 15 gallons per acre total versus how, I mean, like, do they must be different? Are they different? You have so many more nozzles per Yeah, yeah, carrier. so it, it will be a little bit different.
All right, that's all. Thank you, Josh.